So, yeah, um, you know, every book uh, will have, somebody will dislike your main character. All you have to do is go look at the reviews <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you will find people that hate your main character and love them. So, yeah. you know, you, you, you can't make it lovable to everybody. So anyway, this is Nerve that I'm going to read from first. And um, uh, as Kim alluded to in the intro, it's about an online game of dares. And they start off just kind of silly and tawdry and work their way into uh, becoming more and more dangerous. And um, I'll just take a minute to say where I got the idea. Um, and uh, I was watching my teenage niece with her cell phone. This is back when there were flip phones five, six years ago. And uh, she'd ha be interacting with the family and at the same time having a complete uh, interaction with her friends back home in Oregon. And, um, you know, she's just living these parallel lives, and uh, I thought it would be really interesting to have a book that kind of mirrors life going on in the real world and over phones. Um, and at the same time, we were seeing a lot of reality TV, and uh, I don't know how much reality TV you watch, but you know, I was paying attention to it and noticing that people were doing increasingly awful behaviors for fame or money or whatever. And, uh, things that I thought were just totally unacceptable a few years before, like voting people off an island in Survivor. I thought that was so mean when I was going to the school of social work. I thought, oh, it's just so dysfunctional. And then, you know, five years later, it's, everything goes on, on the Jersey Shore. So um, I, I did some research, and I, I know all the names of the Kardashian-Jenner family, and I did know all the names of the Jersey Shore folks. And so. In the name of research, you know, I saw how far people could be uh, pushed into just really interesting behavior. So that's where this book goes. And uh, what I'm going to read is the prologue. I guess since this is a writer's group, I'll say that uh, before I wrote this book, I was always told, never write a prologue. It's <laughs> only for amateurs who never, never, ever write a prologue. So I never had written a prologue. This is my fifth manuscript um, uh, that I had written. And as soon as I got my very first editorial letter, they said, you know, have you thought about writing a prologue? <laughs> so uh, it was very fun to write a prologue, I have to say. But uh, so, so much for rules. <laughs> so the prologue is from the um, point of view of a girl named Abigail. He plays the game of nerve um, a month before V and the rest of this book takes place. So it took three days of waiting, but at 4 a.m. on a Sunday, the street in front of her home finally emptied of all watchers. Maybe even crazies needed to sleep once in a while. Abigail could use some rest too, but more than that, she craved freedom. It had been almost a week since she left her house. She scribbled a note for her parents, threw a pile of gear into her car, and sped off, peeking into the rearview mirror all the way out of town and throughout the two hour drive to the Shenandoah. The countless times she'd ridden these roads with her family had been filled with games, singing, videos, and sometimes just daydreaming. But this time, it was with a rising sense of panic. Ignoring years of training by her parents to check in with the ranger when she reached the park, she left the car near the, net, the most deserted trail that she could find and took off on a pack, path where the foliage was on the verge of being overgrown. By early afternoon, she'd have to settle on a spot to set up camp. For now, she just wanted to disappear into the greenery. If she could evade the watchers for a little while longer, this greenery would bring her some measure of peace, at least for a few days. Her backpack weighed heavy on her shoulders as she pounded up the rocky hillside, pushing past ferns and catching the occasional drops of dew that lingered on the leaves. The rushing sound up ahead spurred her on with the promise of a waterfall. It would be a blessed distraction from the constant rumination that had taken over her thoughts for the past 23 days. Damn game. She swatted a low-hanging branch, dumping water and leaves on her head. Whatever, it wasn't as if anyone were around to witness the bits and pieces plastered to her skin and hair. But the thought of other people led immediately to consistent, unwanted images and fears. Fears that lived at the edge of her consciousness and seemed to take physical form, this time in the sound of soft footfalls behind her. She stood
stood stock still, waiting, praying that the sound had just been her imagination. Her, her brain betrayed her a lot lately. Stop, focus, think. The footsteps halted for a moment and then picked up again faster. Yes, there was someone behind her. What now? Hide behind a bush and let the person pass? It had to be a random hiker, probably looking for solitude the way she was. Still, concealment sounded like the best plan. She raced ahead to gain some distance and tucked herself within the arms of a lush rodent. The footsteps became louder. Their heaviness suggested someone large. Was this the consequence those jerks who ran the game threatened if she didn't make herself available to the fans? But no one could expect her to make nice with the jerks who called at all hours, the creeps who follow her into bathrooms, or the sickos who created that horrifying website with crosshaired images of herself and the other players. When she found that, she invented an illness that kept her home for the past week. But she couldn't hide forever. And it wasn't like she could get a restraining order for the whole plan. Her breathing became quicker and shallower as whoever was behind her approached. The steps were rhythmic measured. Maybe they weren't human. Funny how the possibility of a black bear concerned her less than if the intruder were a fellow hiker. Or maybe the footsteps weren't even real. This could all be a dream, manipulated in the same way her every waking thought had been during the game, and even after. It was getting harder to figure out what was truly happening. Like the note she'd found in a magazine when she'd snuck out to the mall. Dear Abigail, the game isn't over until we say it is. How could anyone have known she'd visit that particular store and glance at that particular magazine? Yet, by the time she ripped through every other magazine on the rack to see if any others had been tampered with, she'd lost track of the offending note altogether, as if it never existed. Probably stolen by one of the unknown we who spied on her every move. That was the worst part, not knowing what her enemy looked like while her own image was available to all, like a perverse kind of trading card. Now the footsteps were joined by whistling. Even in her active imagination, she couldn't conceive of a scenario where an animal knew the tune to somewhere over the rainbow. Her eyes rolled up as she willed herself to believe that this person was simply a trucker in a good mood. The footsteps halted. She crouched deeper into the greenery as the bushes nearby rustled. A deep voice said, I know you could hear. Her gut went to jelly. She pressed herself into the tree behind her, wishing, she, wishing she'd climbed it instead. There was no one around for miles, and a quick peek at her phone showed no reception. Figured. Her phone only dis delivered misery these days. The branches of the rhododendron she was hiding within parted to reveal a man with a face like a pit bull and breath that smelled like bacon. Oh, God. Not knowing what her tormentors looked like had been. This image would play a featured role in her nightmares for the rest of her life, all the long that was. His meaty hands pulled the branches apart. Why not come out, sweetie? Make things easier on both of us. Every muscle contracted and her knees almost gave way. The total dread rising in her belly was worse than during the last round of the game when she faced her own mistakes. To think that that, that, that is to be her biggest fear in the world. Despite the shudder racking her chest, she somehow found the strength to say, Leave me alone, asshole. He startled. No need to get nasty. I've been your biggest supporter. Her eyes darted through the shady undergrowth. Only one option held any hope. She let her pack slip from her shoulders to the ground before springing toward the thinnest section of branches. But there was still enough to scratch her arms as she bashed through them onto the trail. Unfortunately, the man blocked the path leading toward her car. So the only option was to head farther into the hidden forest. She ran, followed by the thundering footsteps behind her. All sounds soon became absorbed in the crashing waterfall ahead, which sprayed her face with a fine mist. The only way forward was down a steep rocky cliff, boulders thick with moss. From behind came discordant whistling in a pitch that cut through the wind, cut, cut through the sound of the water. She turned to face the man. His pockets bulged with jagged shapes that brought to mind the various weapons in the game of Clue. Not that he'd need a candlestick or knife, with his arms as thick as the nearby tree trunks. What did he want? 
Was he a rabid fan who decided to punish her for missing a log broadcast with all the other players the night before? She watched it, her hand held to her mouth, as her fellow players joked and laughed, despite the twitches in her cheek and the dark circles on her eyes. Yet none of them would answer her texts afterwards, as if associating with her were more of a threat than whoever was haunting them. It was insane. No one had said anything about follow-up videos or stalkers when she signed up to play. She climbed over the fence, trying to keep hold of the slippery metal. Could she make her way down to the river without breaking her neck? No need for that, Abigail, the man grunted and reached into his pocket. Just come back here and work with me. We could capture something that no one else has. Earn a thousand credits. Credits. He must be one of those crazies who captured video of the players for no other reason to, than to earn the respect of his fellow watchers, which was awarded in the form of credits. If there were a way to measure the terror, this guy was hitting the jackpot. The curves got off the But would this guy take things a step farther? The throat tightened up the thought. Deep breaths, concentrate on the way out. He cocked his head at her, as if considering lighting the composition. Was it possible that all he wanted from her was a picture? Her breath caught as he slowly withdrew his hand from his pocket. All she could think of was how odd that her life didn't flash before her eyes. What she remembered instead was an old movie she saw in eighth grade English class, The Lady of the Tiger. It had ticked her off that the film of the audience in the lurch. Why couldn't they just pick a damn ending? And now, for her, a stranger could be pulling out a camera or a gun, depending on what he wanted to steal, her image or her life. With a sob, she realized that part of her wish for the option she wouldn't have dreamed of choosing before she played the game. Just so this horror would have become her reality would end. His hand popped out of his right pocket, clutching the camera, tiny and black, like a cute little bug. She accepted the choke back right away. So, a picture after all. Maybe if she tried really hard, she could fake a smile and this would be over. She could run down the trail, drive like a demon back home, and hide in her room for the rest of the day. The watchers would have to lose interest in her eventually, especially when another game with a new cast of players took place. Smart and pretty, the man in front of her said. She stared at him and tried to raise the corners of her mouth. A bead of sweat rolled down her temple, followed quickly by another. A few more seconds and this would all be over. Click. She exhaled again. Okay, if that's what you wanted, fine. Well, not fine, but survival. And then, with a lopsided grin, the man reached into his backpack. So my daughter would say, dun dun dun. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so that's, that's the beginning of Nerve and uh, the prologue that I had so much fun writing. And um, this, I'll do a, a much shorter reading from since that one was kind of long. But um, like, uh, like it says on my website, I, I try to think of uh, young adult novels that could take place next week, um, just you know, on the edge of kind of what's technically possible. And uh, with charisma, uh, you know, they say all births, books are birthed differently, and that was really the case here because with Nerve, the story just came out. Um, and yeah, Hanukkah was my critique of the time. I was like, uh, charisma, not so. So much. Um, it started off as a completely different book about a girl whose mom was kidnapped by terrorists, and it was going to take place in Indonesia because I had a trip planned there with my family, and uh, it was going to be about being disconnected and overconnected with society, etc. But um, something happened, and it was um, preparing for that trip. I read the State Department website, which had rabies flying for Indonesia, and I just started freaking out. I mean, it to consume every way of that. How can I keep my dog, kids away from the dogs? Because my husband, whose relatives all live there, told me, oh yeah, there's dogs all over, there's dogs everywhere in Bali. And freaking out, freaking out. And it was driving me crazy. And we couldn't cancel the trip. There was all this family stuff scheduled there. And so I finally thought, okay, maybe I can channel all this crazy to something productive. Writer? Productive place is, 
And um, I thought, what if there were a virus that, yes, we really feel but had an upside? Like, it made you really charismatic and uh, give you a rock star personality. So the virus became gene therapy, and uh, so it was part. So the little bit I'm going to read is um, when Ace, when the main character, is visiting Nova Genetics, and uh, her mentor, Dr. Sternfeld, uh, who she's done a lot of science projects with from school, and who has worked with Ace and his little brother, Sammy, with cystic fibrosis, and really could be helped with gene therapy. Uh, uh, she runs into Dr. Sternfeld, and this is what happens. So Dr. Sternfeld leans toward me. Hello, Aislinn. How are we? Are you? They're out of family, but by the time you um, Not very. Care for a visit with our long-armed friends? As if I would never ever say no to playing with the chimps. Sure. She leads us down a quiet corridor away from the cafeteria. What a relief to get away from paperwork for a day. I know I should make it nice before getting to business, but I can't stop, stop myself from saying, so is Sammy a, a, a viable candidate for the new drug? She winks. Well, I can't provide any details just yet. But the guidelines do provide a fair amount of room for discretion. Thanks so much for whatever you do. It would mean everything to us. I expect to head outside to the geodesic cages where the chimps normally play. But Dr. Sternfield waits at an unmarked elevator that requires a key. You go down two floors where the AC is on full blast. And then through a winding passageway to an area I haven't visited before. When we reach a heavy door, she raises her eye to a retinal scanner and punches in the code. No other lab I've seen here requires this much security. The room inside glows with full spectrum lighting, but I still get a claustrophobic shudder. This room is even colder than the hallway and smells like rub rubbing alcohol. We stroll past cages to one with a sign that reads, Honey. She's my favorite chimp, and Steffi, her caretaker, used to let me feed her when she was a baby. Even though Ruby should be used to humans, she still hides if the voices around her get too loud. I can relate. We stop in her cage. Ruby scuttles our way and pulls out a knobby hand as if she wants us to shake it. That's a first. Dr. Sternfield laughs and pats her long fingers. I swear Ruby smiles before she does get the world. Dr. Sternfield leans toward me. And even though no one else is nearby, she whispers, yeah, she totally has that, but how did you train her? She scratches from his head. Train? I don't think you understand. I gave her the other therapy I told you about. Her sociability, charisma, or CZ88, if you prefer the official name. The blood rushes to my head so fast I walk. What? You already have a treatment? I thought you were only doing a study. Her eyes gleam. Well, I need to be careful with how much I say to whom. I've got a strong vibe about your trustworthiness, Aislinn. Anyway, I've been working on this since med school. The chimps are my second mammal test. The first group included the most charming rats you'd ever hope to meet. The pounding picks up in my chest. Wow. Wow. I let Ruby take my hand through the bars. She's so friendly. How many chimps have you tested it on? Five. It's like a primate party in here sometimes. I'll bet Steffi loves that. Dr. Sternfield's eyes flash for a moment before she smiles. Yeah, she's enjoying herself. I watch Ruby, who appears to be dancing. She seems really, really happy. Can you measure that? Dr. Sternfield purses her lips. That's subjective to assessing humans, much less animals. But we can measure stress. And Ruby's levels of norepinephrine, cortisol, adrenaline have all decreased significantly. It wouldn't take a blood test my stress hormones were off the ch charts at the party last night. What's my normal happiness level? When I checked with Jack online, my levels spoke upward for sure. But now, low, physically low. Dr. Sternfield continues, no matter how happy the chimps are, there's a huge gap between making the jump from animal trials to human clinical trials. You know what they call that gap in the R&D business? The valley of death. A perfectly good projects need an untimely She's used the term before, but never has it caused me such a pain of disappointment. You can't let this project die. It would be so amazing. Her smile is beautiful. I know. Believe me. 
yet amazing won't be enough to get it approved via official channels anytime soon. Nova Genetics only targets diseases. The more life-threatening, the better. Say in a little voice, sometimes I think feeling this shy, this cripplingly quiet, it's worse than a disease. She sighs, I understand, Aislinn. By the time the world catches up on Gina and Gina and her, probably be ready for a walk. My breathing hitches. So you aren't going to test it on humans anytime soon? A fresh batch of tears bruised behind my eyes, even though I'm sure I used up my quota last night. Her face goes steely, and she grinds the toe of her pump into the white tie floor. It's ridiculous. Can you imagine how many people crippled by shyness and social phobia I could help? It would be life-changing. She gives me an appraising look. I've seen the questionnaires you filled out for the family dynamics study. Have you ate to speak so badly, to be heard, but at the same time are terrified to? When I started college at 14, I was the tiniest kid in the room with the squeakiest voice, unable to raise my hand though I knew all the answers. I know about keeping my hand down. Then what it's like to keep your spirit trapped up at grand level. It's hard to believe gene therapy could make it even braver. Says, well, personality is terribly complex. Charisma targets multiple genes that work in harmony. DNA that might be dismissed by other researchers. But one scientist's trash is another's treasure. I can't picture genes as tiny packets of trash or treasure, but Dr. Sternfeld never shies away from colorful descriptions. I kick at the tile, mirroring Dr. Sternfeld. If you were able to get approval, how long before you had something you could test? She cocks her head and stares at me for a long time. What's right now? My vision goes blurred. As in today now? Today now, she says, with as much of a grin as she'll allow. I shiver, and it's safe. <laughs> 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 <laughs>